Motivation. It's a word that refers to the reasons for why we do what we do. While some people are motivated by the fear of punishment or what some might call the stick, others are motivated by the promise of rewards, which uh, some might refer to as the carrot. Regardless of whether you're motivated by the stick or the carrot, uh, the fact is that many of us are motivated by intellectual interests, while others are motivated by the pursuit of pleasure. Athletes are motivated by the challenge of competition, while gregarious people are motivated by the community of connection. And then there are those who spend $3,000 on a Diamond Premier ticket to see Tony Robbins so that he can motivate us to unleash the power within by walking on a bed of hot coals. And then many of those people call the ambulance to come and get them after their feet are completely burned. You might not know this, but the world is actually filled with motivational speakers who are here to inspire us to become better people. And as we consider the growing popularity of these motivational speakers like Tony Robbins and Eric Thomas and Joel Osteen, it seems clear to me that the masses feel a need to be motivated. We feel this, this need to surround ourselves with motivating people who are here to inspire us with their stories. And if this sounds like you, if you uh, feel like you're one of those people who constantly needs motivation, you, you feel like you're a person who you're not going to take one more step unless someone comes along and motivates you, uh, then I'm here to motivate you this morning by encouraging you to seek the motivation that comes from our Messiah. Here in our study this morning, we're going to consider three of the ways in which our Messiah motivates us to live every day of our lives for the glory of God. And as we make our way through our text today, we'll begin to see, first of all, that the Messiah motivates us with the faith of scriptural assurance. Secondly, we'll see that the Messiah motivates us with the focus of sacrificial vigilance. And then thirdly and finally, we'll see that the Messiah motivates us with the favor of spiritual guidance. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. Here we find John, he's wrapping up the book of Revelation with the prophetic promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you make your way to, to Revelation 22, I want to continue setting the stage for our text today. And I want to do this by taking a moment to present you with a list of prophecies which must be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ. As we've seen throughout our study of this book, the time of tribulation must take place before the Lord Jesus returns. And this seven-year period of time will begin when the false Messiah, known as the Antichrist, rises up to rule over the earth. And as a result, there's going to be wars and famine and pestilence and cosmic catastrophes which will impact the planet. And to sum it up with all simplicity, all of the prophetic events found in this book must come to pass before the second coming of Christ. Sadly, this also includes the persecution of the tribulation age saints. And while it's true that the saints of God will suffer incredible persecution during the time of tribulation, it's also true that the final prophetic promise found in the Bible was designed to comfort and, and encourage and motivate those who trust in Christ. And in order to understand how the second coming of Christ will comfort the hearts of those who trust in him, I want to take some time to consider the way in which this prophetic promise will fill us with faith. It fills us with the faith of scriptural assurance. And with this as our focus, if you would look with me here at Revelation chapter 22, we'll begin reading at verse 20 where John declares, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, here in the final verses of the Bible, uh, we find the Lord Jesus testifying to the truth of his second coming. That word testifies, which is found there in verse 20, it's translated from a Greek word which was used of those who were called upon to bear witness of something that they saw. And it's for this reason that the scholars who gave us the New Living Translation, they rendered the beginning of verse 20 in this way. He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. 
Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He is the one who uh, bears testimony of all of the things that he knows will happen. And he tells us, I'm coming soon. John is letting us know that we can believe in the second coming of Christ because Jesus is a faithful witness. Jesus also gave us assurance of his second coming by declaring, surely I am coming quickly. That word surely, well, it's translated from a Greek word which was used to present a strong affirmation of assurance. Well, in other words, the Lord Jesus wasn't just saying, I'm coming soon, but instead he's assuring his audience that, that there should be no doubt in our minds. It's sure, it's, it's something that will surely take place. There should be no doubt in our minds about his second coming, or just to put it in Texan terms, just so that we're all on the same page, Jesus was simply saying, I'm fixing to return as sure as the day is long. In light of this assurance, it's sad to say that there are still many skeptics who scoff at our belief in Christ's second coming. The Apostle Peter prophetically warned about these naysayers. In the third chapter of his second epistle, there he tells us that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, Peter was encouraging his audience to understand that the world is actually going to be filled with unbelievers who will ridicule the followers of Christ. They're going to ridicule us for our belief in the second coming. And we see that this ridicule will center around uh, this, this faith that we have that it won't be long before the return of our Lord. Thankfully for us, though, there's good reason for us to believe in the second coming of Christ. And in order to prove my point, if you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to Zechariah chapter 12. As you make your way to the 12th chapter of Zechariah, I want to take a moment to point out that the disciples of Jesus were completely confused about the crucifixion of our Christ. And one of the main reasons why was due to the fact that the first century Jews were looking for a conquering king. They, they wanted a conquering king who would come and free them from the tyranny of the Roman Empire. And so when Jesus arrived, his disciples were thinking, this is it. This is the conquering king and he's ready to take the throne and he's going to run out the Romans. What they were failing to grasp was that the Old Testament prophets, they actually present us with two lines of Messianic prophecies. These two lines of prophecy point us to a Messiah who would first die as a suffering servant before then returning as a conquering king. And so the first century uh, disciples, they were looking for the conquering king. Uh, they didn't really recognize that he was going to be a suffering servant first. In order to further prove my point about these two lines of Messianic prophecies, if you would look with me here at Zechariah chapter 12, I want to draw your attention to verse 7 where Zechariah declares, The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And notice, then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Here in this prophecy, we find Zechariah. He's pointing to the day when the Messiah will destroy the enemies of Israel. And according to the prophet here, this is also the day when the inhabitants who are there in Jerusalem are going to look upon their Messiah and they're going to recognize that this is the one whom their forefathers had previously pierced. And so we see both lines of Messianic prophecy here. Uh, the, the Messiah who was pierced, the, the one who was crucified and, and, and stabbed in the heart with a, with a spear, they, they see this Messiah then returning to destroy the enemies of Israel. And in light of this, we can see then that the, the promised Messiah would first come and be pierced. And then after being put to death, he returns as a conquering king who destroys 
the enemies of Israel. Now, as we consider these two lines of prophecy, I want to remind you that the Lord Jesus has already fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies which point to the first advent of the promised Messiah. In order to quantify what this means, the the Lord Jesus has actually fulfilled more than 300 Messianic prophecies which present us with specific details about his birth, his life, death, burial, and his resurrection. And as we saw in our study last week, the probability of one man fulfilling all of these Old Testament prophecies, it is entirely astronomical. And you get yet against all odds. The eyewitness reports from the first century confirm our belief that Jesus has in fact fulfilled all of those prophecies. For more on this, I would invite you to go back and listen to our study from last week where I go into this argument with more detail. But I want you to think about it like this. If the Lord Jesus has in fact fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies which point to the suffering servant, then I would argue we can also believe that the Lord Jesus is also going to fulfill the prophecies that point to the arrival of Israel's conquering king. If Jesus has in fact, and I believe that he has, fulfilled all of those Old Testament prophecies that point to his first coming, then what's the probability that he is going to fulfill the prophecies that point to his second coming? I think the odds are in our favor. The Lord Jesus is not only the promised Messiah who was pierced, but he's also the conquering king who will eventually return and destroy the enemies of Israel. It's on that day when the inhabitants of Jerusalem will see the second coming of the promised Messiah. It's at that point when they'll recognize, hey, this is the one whom we pierced. And then they will rejoice as the king of kings takes his rightful place on the throne of David and begins to rule and reign over the earth with a rod of iron. And while it's true that the house of David will rejoice on that incredible day, it's also true that the prophecies that point to the second coming of Christ, well, they should motivate the born-again believer today with the faith that comes from this sort of scriptural assurance. I think that Paul put it best in his letter to the church in Colossae. And so if you would, continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation and turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 because it's in the third chapter of Colossians where we find Paul He's demonstrating the assurance of faith that he had in the prophetic scriptures that point us to the second coming of Christ. With this in mind, if you would look with me here at Colossians chapter 3, I want to focus your attention there on verse 1. Here Paul declares, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Here in these verses we find Paul. He's encouraging the Christians there at the church in Colossae by reminding them about all of the prophetic promises which point to the day when those who trust in Christ Jesus will return with him in glory. And on that glorious day, he's going to establish his millennial kingdom. Uh, Therefore, uh, we ought to be motivated today to set our minds on things above. Knowing that the born-again believer will return with Jesus in glory, uh, we ought to make sure that our mind is where the Lord wants our mind to be. We ought to be focusing on those things above where Christ is seated. Knowing that it won't be long before we find ourselves in his presence. Knowing that it won't be long before he returns in glory. Knowing that we will be with him. We should be living our life today in a way that's pleasing to him. This should become a great motivation for us. And this also brings us to our second point, because listen, the Messiah not only motivates us with the faith of scriptural assurance, wanting us to really trust in the fact that we're going to be with him in glory, but the Messiah also motivates us with the focus of sacrificial vigilance. And in order to explain what I mean by that, I'd like you to make your way back to Revelation chapter 22. I want to focus your attention once again at verse 20 where John declares, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. And then John writes, amen. 
Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now, here in the second half of this verse, we find the Apostle John. He's proclaiming this hearty amen. For the sake of clarity, it'll help you to know that the Greek word, which here is translated amen, it's an interjection of strong agreement, which is a simple way of saying, let it be fulfilled. That's what John is saying. Let it be fulfilled. When John heard the Lord Jesus prophetically promising to quickly return, John expresses his absolute trust and confidence in the second coming of Christ by simply saying, yes, amen. Let's get this party started. Not only that, but John also doubled down on his hearty amen by declaring, even so. That phrase, even so, was translated from the Greek word that, that Jesus used when he said, surely. So it's, it's like Jesus says, surely I'm coming quickly. And John says, amen, surely let it happen. To that, Jesus says, quit calling me Shirley. That's horrible, I know. If I were Jesus, you know, I would have been like, yeah, you, you bet. Surely this is going to happen. And surely it will. But John here is simply agreeing with the prophetic promise of the Lord Jesus by declaring, amen and yes, and then come, Lord Jesus. Now, as we consider John's desire for the return of the Lord Jesus, I would remind you where he's writing this letter. It'll help you to remember that he's writing this letter. It's around 95 AD, and he's been imprisoned on the island of Patmos. It was back in the first chapter of this book where John tells us that he had been exiled to the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. According to Tertullian, the apostle John was first plunged, unhurt, into boiling oil and then remitted to his island exile. It was there where John received the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we've been studying for the past year and a half. And in light of this imprisonment, in light of the, the, the persecution that he endured, I mean, just imagine, first of all, uh, facing a cauldron of boiling oil and then, and then supernaturally surviving that, only to then be exiled to this prison colony. It seems to me that it was the Lord's plan to allow John to be exiled to that island so that he could focus his attention on the prophecies that point to the second coming of Christ. And while there's no doubt in my mind that the persecutions that he suffered were difficult to endure, we can also be certain that the promise of Christ's second coming, uh, it became a motivation for the apostle John because it provided him with hope for the future. When we're in the middle of enduring something that's extremely difficult and painful, if there's a silver lining on the cloud, if there's something to hope for, then it's easier to get through the troubling time. And in order to further explain what I'm saying, if you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to John chapter 15. As you make your way to the 15th chapter of John's gospel account, I want to take a moment to remind you that John was intimately aware of the persecution that Jesus himself had endured. Remember, he was the only disciple who was actually there when Christ Jesus was crucified. And, and let me restate that. He was the only male disciple. He was the only apostle who was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. He was there when the Lord Jesus cried out in the midst of his pain and persecution, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here's Jesus being persecuted. He's being martyred. He's being murdered. And yet implores the Father for forgiveness on behalf of those who were crucifying him. John was also there when the Lord Jesus prophetically pointed to the way in which his disciples would suffer similar persecutions. As a matter of fact, look with me here at John chapter 15, I want you to look with me there at verse 18 where the Lord declares, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, 
it will keep yours also. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's presenting a prophetic promise, which points us to the persecution of the saints. And and you know, I've never really seen this text on a motivational poster hanging up in someone's office. This doesn't seem very motivating to me. This just seems like a real downer. And I can only imagine that these words echoed around in the mind of John as he found himself being plunged into boiling oil. I I can only imagine uh, that these words echoed in his ears as he faced the persecution that Jesus previously promised. I can only imagine how he's being sent to the the island of Patmos to, to live on this prison colony and him remembering the words of Christ. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. At the same time, I'm going to guess that John was able to endure all of this persecution by simply focusing his mind on the prophetic promise of Christ's soon return. And with this in mind, let's, let's back up one chapter. I'd like you to look back at John chapter 14. Because before Jesus promised that they were going to suffer persecution, he first promised that he would return for them. As a matter of fact, look with me there at John chapter 14, verse 1. Here the Lord Jesus declares, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Now where I am, There you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Here in these verses, we find the Lord, he's comforting the troubled hearts of his disciples. And he did this by pointing them to the promise of the glory that we will experience in the resurrection. And it's my guess that this prophetic promise, which was provided to the apostle John, it it provided him with the messianic motivation that he needed so that he could continue to serve the Lord in the face of persecution. I'm guessing that this is the promise that motivated him to become a vigilant Christian who is willing to lay down his life for others. In similar fashion, I believe that our Messiah also wants to motivate us to to serve him with the same sort of sacrificial vigilance. And in order to prove my point, if you would continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation, and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. As you make your way to 2 Corinthians 4, I want to take a moment to consider the recent research which reveals the reason for why so many soldiers are willing to go out and sacrifice themselves for the the greater good of their country. The research which was published in a journal called Nature, Human Behavior, uh, this research found that in many cases... The focused motivations of those sacrificial soldiers, they center around the immovable and unshakable values of their sacred beliefs. It's the immovable and unshakable values of their sacred beliefs that lead them to go out and put their life on the line on behalf of those they leave behind at home. Based on this, we can see then that the faith in the promises of Jesus, our faith in our immovable and unshakable values that that are found in the sacred beliefs of the Christian faith, these will become the motivators for our sacrificial service. This was precisely the sort of motivation that led Paul to serve the Lord with this same sort of sacrificial vigilance. Remember, Paul was the disciple who had been beaten with rods. He had been whipped five times. He had been stoned three times. He spent a night and a day in the ocean after being shipwrecked. He constantly found himself facing all manner of danger, including robbers and wild animals and false accusers who wanted him dead. Paul suffered from weariness and toil, sleeplessness and hunger, cold and nakedness, as well as a constant concern for every Christian church. 
And yet, despite all of these trials, despite all of these tribulations, Paul continued moving forward uh, with just complete desire to serve the Lord. Now, what could motivate a man to live this kind of life where he's willing to just lay down everything for the sake of our Savior? Well, I think that Paul gives us some insight into his mindset here, and we get a glimpse of his motivation here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you would look with me, beginning at verse 8, here Paul declares, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, notice, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here in these verses we find Paul, he's describing this motivation that he had which which was driving him forward and helping him to serve the Lord with sacrificial vigilance. You see, Paul truly believed that his selfless sacrifice would result in the salvation of others. And so he was willing to endure every difficulty. He was willing to suffer at the hands of sinners so that some might be saved. Now, now, now grasp that in, in comparison to the embarrassment that we might feel if we go out and share our faith with people. I don't want to suffer the embarrassment. Come on. Seriously? Paul's being tortured and stoned and whipped and run out of cities and yet continues with complete motivation because he recognizes that some might be saved. Knowing that there's coming this day when the Lord Jesus is going to return and judge the nations, Paul found comfort in the midst of his trials and tribulations as he realized that the suffering that he was enduring was worth it especially in comparison to the exceeding and eternal weight of glory, which is going to be enjoyed by all those people who get saved. In similar fashion, the apostle Peter was also a sacrificial servant who was motivated by the second coming of Christ. And with this as our focus, continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. You see, it's in 2 Peter 3 where we find the Apostle Peter. He's encouraging every Christian to realize that there's coming a day when the Lord Jesus will return and he's going to establish his millennial kingdom. And while it's true that we don't currently have a clue when that day will come, it's also true that the born-again believer should live today as if the Lord Jesus is already seated upon that throne. As a matter of fact, let's consider how Peter puts it here in 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to begin reading at verse 10. Here Peter assures his audience of the fact that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening 
the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Here in these verses we find Peter, he's encouraging every Christian to realize that the born-again believer ought to be living for and longing for the day when the Lord Jesus rules and reigns over the earth from the throne of David. We ought to be focusing our sights on that glorious day. That's what we should be looking forward to and living towards. We should walk in the messianic motivation of his second coming, which, which then enables us to overcome every trial and every tribulation with the same sacrificial vigilance that John was demonstrating there on the island of Patmos. No doubt about it, his life was tough. There's no doubt about it that, that John and, and Peter and Paul and all those first century disciples had a life that was extremely difficult because the, 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 the plan to, to stand up and speak the gospel message was certain death. The pain of persecution would come upon any Christian that stood up there in the late first century and took a stand for Christ. And it would have been so easy to just say, you know what? Didn't sign up for this. Somebody told me to come to Christ and my whole life is going to be really comfy. But that's not what Jesus promised. He, he promised that those who come to him are going to be persecuted in similar fashion. That can be very demotivating. And yet our Messiah wants to motivate us so that we can, like John, gladly declare, Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. I know that when I'm suffering persecution, when I'm f facing ridicule and scoffers and, and those who would make fun of my faith, it, it just gives me a heart to reach them. It gives me a desire to lead them to Christ. And it reminds me that this world is not my home. I'm motivated to look forward to the second coming when the Lord is going to separate the scoffers and the unbelievers from those who trust in him. This brings us to our third point because, listen, the motivation of our Messiah will not only provide us with the faith of scriptural assurance and the focus of sacrificial vigilance, but the motivation of our Messiah will also provide us with the favor of spiritual guidance. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's make our way back to Revelation chapter 22. I want to focus your attention once again there at verse 20. Here John declares, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Here in the final verse of the Bible here, we find John. He's now invoking the grace of God upon those who read this revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the sake of clarity, the Greek word, which was translated grace, it refers to the goodwill or the loving kindness, or you might say the, the merciful favor of our gracious God. Therefore, John was wrapping up this letter by assuring his audience that those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, well, we're walking in the merciful favor of our gracious God. And I love that. What a, what a great way to end the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The, the merciful favor, the loving kindness of our God be with you all. Amen. Now, in order to further grasp how the grace of God motivates us, if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And as you make your way to Ephesians 2, I want to take a moment to address a common mistake, which is made by many, many Christians. You see, it's not uncommon for the born-again believer to insist that we're saved by faith and by faith alone. Now, before you stone me as a heretic, I just want to point out that the repentant Christian indeed receives the gift of God's grace by faith and by faith alone and not by the works of of the law. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And so salvation is received 
by faith and not by works. And yet at the same time, it's also true that we're saved by grace, which is received by faith. And that's an important point to make here. We're actually saved by the gracious favor of God, which is received by faith. Or in other words, the gracious gift of God is the catalyst by which the favor of his forgiveness can be received by faith and by faith alone. Let's consider how Paul puts it here in Ephesians chapter 2. If you would look with me there at verse 8, here Paul declares, for by faith? No. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, here in these verses, we see that the repentant sinner is saved when we receive the free gift of God's grace. And that gift of grace is received by faith. Well, it's true that the favor which results in forgiveness must be received by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also true that there are many Christians who place the greater emphasis on their faith than they do on God's grace. They, they, they like to emphasize their faith over God's grace. Please trust me when I tell you that our faith doesn't save us. No, God's grace saves us when we receive it by faith. In order to further grasp the point that I'm trying to make here, imagine with me for a moment that it's your child's birthday party. And you're super excited because, you know, what they wanted you really couldn't afford. And, and, and so you spent a lot of time saving money for it. And, and, then, and then a little bit, bit of extra money came your way. And, and, and you didn't think you were going to be able to buy this gift. But then all of a sudden you could. And, and so you're just excited. You're excited that, that you could buy them this expensive present that they really, really wanted. And, and then comes the special moment, that special birthday. And, and the cake is eaten and the ice cream is melted. And, and, and you're just so happy to see them open this perfectly wrapped present. And, and your heart begins to melt because you, you can't wait to see the excitement in their face. And they're tearing through the packaging. And with all excitement, your, your child opens it up and says, yes, yes. I'm so happy that my faith was strong enough to produce this gift. <laughs> my faith is incredible. I believed that I was going to receive this gift, and so I did. Clearly, this child is confused about the role they played in the procurement of that pricey present. It's in similar fashion that there are many Christians who are so focused on their faith my faith, you know, hold on a second. If you put your faith in a false Messiah, can that false Messiah save you? No. If you place your faith in something that, that can't help you, I don't care how strong your faith is. It's not about how awesome your faith is. It's about how awesome God's grace is. And much like the kid on his birthday, all we got to do is just receive it. That's it. It's received by faith, but it's God's grace. His merciful favor by which we are saved through faith. Knowing that the Christian has simply received the grace of God by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we should become those believers who are motivated to, to give God all the glory for the favor that he's graciously given to us. And listen, the grace of God not only saves the believer, but I'm here to tell you that it's his grace uh, by which we're con continuing to move forward each and every moment of every day. It's his grace that, that empowers us to stand and, and, and walk as Christians. In order to prove my point, I'd like you to turn with me to John chapter 1, because here we find John referring to the ongoing grace which the Lord continues to pour out upon those who trust in him. And as you make your way to the first chapter of John's gospel account, I want to remind you that the apostle John concludes the book of Revelation by declaring the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ continue to be with you. 
John was encouraging us to recognize that our Messiah has a plan to motivate us with his gracious favor, not, not just at the moment of our salvation, but in an ongoing, continuing way. With this in mind, look with me here at John chapter 1. I want to begin reading at verse 14. Here John tells us that the word or the logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Now, it's a little clunky here, the way that the New King Jimmy puts it. In order to understand what this grace for grace is, It'll help you to understand that those who trust in the Messiah have received grace for grace, or, or in other words, we've received grace upon grace. Or as the scholars who gave us the New English translation put it, we have all received from his fullness one gracious gift after another. Christian, please understand that, that the moment you think that you've exhausted the grace of God, God is there to saying, oh, here's some more grace. The moment you think that you've come to the end of God's grace, he's like, oh, nope, here's more grace for you. And from grace to grace to grace, the Lord continues to show his merciful favor to us. The born again believer not only receives the grace of God at the moment of salvation, but the Christian continues to receive the grace of God each and every day. And in order to further grasp how our Messiah motivates us with the ongoing favor of God's grace, if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 5. I'd like you to turn to Romans 5 because it's here in the fifth chapter of Romans where we find the Apostle Paul. He's helping the Christians at the church there in Rome to understand that the gracious favor of God, it's this ongoing gift which enables us to stand in the spiritual strength of the Lord. As a matter of fact, look with me here at Romans 5. I, I want to begin reading at verse 1. Here Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we notice stand. By faith, we have access into this grace in which we are currently now standing and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Paul's helping his audience to understand that those who trust in Jesus are not only justified by the grace of God, but it's by faith in Jesus that we're given the ongoing grace which enables us to stand on the solid foundation of Christ. At every moment we stand with the Lord, we're enabled to stand by his grace. The grace of God empowers us with spiritual strength so that we can become those believers who are established in our Christian faith, it's complete grace. If God were to remove his grace from us, how would we stand? And not only does the grace of God enable us to stand in the spiritual strength of our Savior, but the Lord also enables us to accomplish his will according to the favor of his grace. This was precisely the point that Paul was making in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. There he tells us that God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. I mean, wrap your mind around that for a moment. God has all grace, which he abound, you know, sends to us in abundance, so that we have all sufficiency in all things to perform every good work by his grace that we stand and it's by his grace that we accomplish the good works that he's given us to do. I should also point out that the Greek word which is translated grace, which is charis, it's also the basis for the Greek word which is translated gift, which is charisma. And so the charisma of God is based on the grace of God, which is the favor of God. To sum it up with simplicity, it's in 1 Peter 4, verse 10, where the apostle Peter declares, 
as each one has received a gift, charisma. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace, charis of God. Based on this, we can see that there's this manifold grace or, or these different forms of God's grace, which manifest as charismatic gifts. And, and, and the Christian has received at least one of these charismatic gifts so that we can then serve one another here within our fellowship of faith. It's all the favor of God. His merciful favor has provided us with charismatic gifts so that we can serve one another. And knowing that the Lord Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to come and empower us with these spiritual gifts of grace, then we can see how our Messiah is the one who is motivating us to serve him. And part of this grace is the favor of spiritual guidance by which he leads us into his perfect will. Now, as we begin to wrap up this incredible book, it's my hope that we'll all realize that we don't need the motivation that comes from those secular speakers who present us with their inspiring stories. And I don't mean to sit here and just dismiss every motivational speaker. I'm sure we've all been blessed by one or two of them. And I'm not saying that there's no place for motivational speakers. That's not my point. But all I mean to say is that the best motivation for the Christian comes from our Messiah. If you're lacking motivation in your life, please look to the Messiah. Look to Jesus. If you're a Christian who's struggling to serve him, if you're, if you're a Christian who's struggling to, to go out and share your faith, if you're a, a Christian who's, who's struggling uh, to take one more step forward because, because you don't think that you have the strength to do it, I'm here to tell you, you don't. And you were never expected to, in the power of your strength, take one more step forward. And, and it breaks my heart whenever I see Christians just you know, throwing in the towel and giving up and it just got too hard and they just could Yeah, that's the whole point. We need to stop thinking that we are the ones who are required to do it and we have to realize that the Lord Jesus is the one who can motivate us and empower us so that we can do what he's calling us to do. Listen, if he's calling you to do something that you could do naturally, then <laughs> you don't need him. He's always going to call us to do something that we in and of ourselves can't do and so that when we do it by his strength and power, he gets all the glory out of it. You think I'm equipped to be a pastor? <laughs> I mean, come on, look at me. I can look at this position and say, oh, I can't. And the Lord Jesus, Jesus would just say, yeah, you can't. You're a dummy. And yet then he turns around and motivates me to do what he's called me to do. And so I get up and by his power, do it. And that's the same for you. The Messiah will motivate you if you'll simply just spend time with him. If you spend time with your Savior, you'll be to begin to discover how our Messiah motivates us with the faith of scriptural assurance. Our Messiah motivates us with the focus of sacrificial vigilance. And our Messiah motivates us with the favor of spiritual guidance. He's the one who's going to push us forward. He's the one who can give us the strength that we need for tomorrow. And in light of these incredible truths, I just simply want to conclude our study of this incredible book with the words of John. Because I don't know any better way to wrap up our study of this book than with the words of John who declared, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.